Um, hello, everybody. This talk is going to be held by Steve Langeshek. Um He's going to talk about the PAM off. What is it called again? PAM off update. Thank you. Uh, he's been a Debian developer for like eight years, and um, he's the maintainer of this project of the PAM off update. And um, enjoy his talk. Uh, in case you have any questions later um, concerning this talk, please make sure you use a microphone. Thanks. Enjoy. Well, thank you. Um, so I'm here to talk today about PAM Auth Update, which is a fun little project uh, that's recently in been introduced into Debian Squeeze. Who here already knows what PAM Auth Update is? A yeah, fair number of people. Uh, how many people have had it break their system? <laughs> Too many. <laughs> you don't count. You were using it in Ubuntu. <laughs> and Mad Duck, I don't believe you. <laughs> so, what is PAM off update? Short description, uh, the easy way to make slides, just steal them from the man page. It manages PAM configuration using packaged profiles, which is a fancy way of saying that at long last, we have a solution in Debian that lets PAM modules auto-configure themselves when you install them, which is really, really nice. Uh, people have wanted this for a long time, um, and we finally have it now. Uh, so yeah, it automatically enabling PAM modules when a package is installed. It, it comes with a debconf-based interface. We're using the, the wonderful debconf work that we have that's common to our packaging system and that, that lots of our maintainer scripts use. PAM auth update is one of these funny standalone programs which also uses debconf. Uh, and it provides this debconf interface that lets admins enable and disable particular PAM modules overriding the defaults. Um, and this idea is something that we've been kicking around for a long time. Um, ever since we split, uh, et cetera, PAMD into having these common-auth, common-password files, uh, there was always this idea in the back of our minds that we would, we would uh, have some way to auto-configure modules and, and have it all be nice, neat, and clean, and, and magical. Um, but it's a, it's a it, yeah, the idea's been around for about six years. Um, and it finally came to fruition with a prototype that landed in Ubuntu 8.10. Um, unfortunately, due to the timing, it, the development was happening on this right about the time that Lenny was going into freeze, so there was no way to sensibly introduce it into Lenny. Uh, instead, it landed as soon as Squeeze opened uh, this, this spring, early this spring, um, at which point it apparently broke a couple people's systems. So, so the first point, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is how you actually use PAM auth update from a perspective of a, of a packager. Um, and basically, it's three simple steps. Eventually, I'd like to have a, a Deb helper tool that will do all this automatically for you the same way everything is done autom automatically for you these days. But you know, for the time being, it's simple enough that I haven't gone to the effort of writing the Perl script because these are the simple steps to do it. You install a profile under this directory. So ship this in your package. Here's an example for the uh, Kerberos 5 package. This is actually taken from the libpam curb 5 package in Debian. Uh, and it shows you the syntax. It, this is a very simple declarative syntax. Well, simple. Um, but it's a, it's a declarative format, uh, so there's no Turing complete zaniness involved here. You don't have to deal with the, the crazy things that uh, maintainers come up with using, using scripting languages if left to their own devices. Uh, and you see here, it, you give it a name, which is actually going to be the, the simple, uh, the, the it, the, the user readable name that's going to be displayed in uh, the debconf interface. Default yes means it's turned on by default. It has a priority which tells PAMAuth update what order to put them together in the config when it puts it together. We, we declare conflicts here which says that if you also have the curb 5 open AFS profile available, you can only pick one or the other. Um, auth type primary, I'll explain a little bit more about that. You see here some lines which if you've ever looked at a PAM config, you can probably gather that those are templates that, that are used to generate the actual PAM config. 
Um, and then you also have sections for both auth, account, password, session, the, the four major groups within PAM configuration. So put one of those together, put together a post inst, which this is the post inst. <laughs> this is actually the, literally the post inst for the libpam curve 5 package is those five lines, two of which are white space. Um, <laughs> the pre-RM is, is somewhat uh, amended here from the actual package because uh, Russ has a 10-line block of comments in there. <laughs> so to fit it on the screen, I only gave you the functional bits. Um, so basically, we have a pre-RM that just on removal tells it that, yeah, we want to remove it again. Um, and I'm going to go through these slides fairly quickly. They are all linked from the uh, the talk profile in Penta. So if you want to follow along with the slides later or at any point, those, those are available on the web already. And profit. That's all there is to it. That's all, all it takes for a maintainer to, to uh, plug in their PAM module so that it can be auto-configured and, and exposed to the interface so that users can enable or disable it uh, according to their preferences. Uh, some of the features that PAM auth update introduces, um, any PAM module package can provide zero or more profiles. You know, a PAM module package doesn't have to do this. It's nice to do it for a number of use cases. There are a lot of, a lot of uses that we're putting this to already. Um, among the packages that are already deploying this in, in um, unstable at least, I don't know if they've reached testing yet, but uh, libpam modules itself for the PAM Unix stuff, we've got PAM cracklib, which if you've ever looked at the old uh, PAM configs, there were all these comments showing how to uncomment things to hook into cracklib, which we don't have installed as part of the base because of the cracklib lib library dependency itself. Well, now you just install the PAM cracklib package and it's automatically configured for you, which is great. Um, so we've got PAM Unix, PAM cracklib's doing it, PAM curve 5. There's a PAM LDAP profile, which I guess I'm not sure. 100% sure that's merged in Debian yet. I know it's available in Ubuntu. Um, SMB password um, for password synchronization with Samba. So auto migration of passwords to Samba is all set up already. Um, Winbind is missing yet. I, that's on my to-do list. But you know, all those PAM modules, whatever you want to configure authentication for, it's really straightforward to do this. And the other thing is that you, know, you can have a package that just ships your profile. If you want to do custom packages for your site-specific authentication configuration, create your profile, put it in a package, set the dependencies right on the other module packages, and, and you're set. You know, declare your conflicts with whatever the, 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 pa the, the PAM module provided profile is, and you can just override it just by doing a, a dependency, and you're good. Um, we have support in PAM auth update for specifying profiles of two kinds. Either they can uh, specify additional requirements for authentication, authorization, those kinds of things, or alternative requirements. So you can have both a system which requires, you know, you, you can say um, user must enter a password and provide a, p a fingerprint in order to authenticate, or, or a thumbprint type thing. Um, or you can say user can do uh, a password using three of one of three different authentication stores. You can, you know, alternatives being local Unix authentication, LDAP, Kerberos, uh, Win, uh, Active Directory authentication, whatever you want it to be. Um, and so there's possibilities of, of both making those alternatives or making them uh, additional uh, requirements, um, which is very fundamental to this. So you you kind of can't do everything you need to do without that flexibility. Uh, and that actually comes back to, uh, oh, let's go back to the earlier slide here, where we say auth type primary um, versus account type additional. So auth type primary says this is a primary means of a method of, of authentication, so it provides an alternative for your primary authentication, whereas account type additional imposes additional authorization constraints on, on the uh, logins. So that's what that's used for. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, profiles can also declare they're mutually exclusive with one another, um, just using conflicts. I, you know, reused a bit of the terminology we're all familiar with from packaging. Uh, it's not very original in that regard. Uh, other features, so we've, it basically lets you specify, jump to the end of the section. Um, I don't know who here does PAM stack configurations or not. Um, the, the original PAM spec from Sun it is fairly linear. 
uh, Linux PAM, which is the implementation we use in Debian and that most other Linux distributions also use, extended the syntax where you can say, on this return code from the module, jump ahead this many modules or all, all this complexity. So uh, we have that capability here as well where you can say, um, it, instead of saying jump ahead two modules or jump ahead three or one or whatever, um, we use this end token which allows you to specify jump to the end of this section of the auto-generated config so that you don't have to know how many other modules there are in the stack. PAMAuth update will figure that out for you. Uh, and another key feature is that it recognizes that PAM modules have to de behave differently depending on where they actually are in the stack. So this is, this is one of the things that, you know, you can't just simply say, I, I want to... So if you've, if you've got multiple authentication modules like Unix and Kerber 5 and, and, and LDAP all stacked together, you don't want to be prompting three times for passwords. Well, the modules need to know whether or not to prompt based on where they are in the stack. So what we've done here is uh, it supports combining forms. Basically, it lets you specify your, your default line that you're going to include, or lines, because you can have multiple lines within a config, uh, and then also specify combining forms. So uh, the, the inspiration for this actually came from um, the, 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 the scripts used in, in Arabic and, and Hebrew, where they have this notion that glyphs change depending on where they are in the sentence. And so I, the, the, the terminology here for initial, final, medial is, is very linguistic. Uh, <laughs> and, but basically it lets you override the behavior of the module, the module profile based on where it's going to line up in that stack. And so that way you, you, get, you, you can have the insurance that the first module in your stack always prompts for the password and then the one stacked after it know to use that password instead of reprompting. So you get much cleaner user experience actually using the, the system. Uh, and again, the default yes, default no, the profiles declare whether or not they're enabled by default so you can get same defaults without having to do any prompting when the user installs the package. So yeah, how many people here run debconf with the default priority of high? And how many people are nitpickers who run it with a lower priority because they want to <laughs> see everything? Well, you'll get prompted. You asked for it, you've got it. Uh, your choice. Um, but at the default high priority, uh, there's no reason to prompt for it. So we just, you know, whatever those defaults are that are provided by the package, if the package maintainer has done their job, you get something out the other end that works right when you choose to install the PAM module and you never have to uh, see any of these devconf prompts at all. Now, you can go back later and just run the PAM auth update command by hand and tweak everything. Did I hit another button when I wasn't looking? Yeah, all right. Um, but you run, the maintainer scripts call the PAM auth update, you install the modules, and here's an output. This is an, an auto-generated config, uh, a real example from a system that has a couple of extra modules installed. I've got libpam curve 5 installed, um, and I've got libpam smb pass installed. So you, you get this output where, on authentication, it will proceed to try Kerberos 5 first for any user with a UID of 1,000 or above, which in Debian is, means all non-system users. Um, and then if that succeeds, it skips the next two modules, gets down to here. If it fails, it falls through to the PAM Unix and tries the first password again. The, the, tries, the, tries to use the same password that the user entered the first time to authenticate against the local Unix database. Um, now, we use try first pass rather than, uh, let's, no, this is authentication, so try first pass is the only option. So this means that if Pam Unix says, oh, that's the wrong password, it will prompt again for the user to, to try re-entering again. Use first pass is actually only available in the password stack. Well, okay, so Walter is saying that, that there is a use first pass option for PAM Unix on the authentication stack as well. So I, I'm probably just misremembering and there is another option. We do try first pass to ensure that the user does have the opportunity to re-enter the password as needed. Um, and then once we're all done, once we've got a, a successful authentication from one of these two modules, we jump down here, PAM permit, this is the module that actually sets our return code for the stack. A and then we also have an additional module here, one of these uh, uh, auth type uh, additional, which will 
do the PAM SMB pass migrate, which does this nifty little evil hack where it takes the user's password and creates a password entry for them in the, S the, the SMB pass database used for Samba authentication. Since, um, since Windows negotiates passwords in a way that, that you cannot extract the necessary information out of uh, MD5 standard Unix password files, we have a separate password store for that. And this will auto-populate it as needed. So you just install that module and you gradually become a fully functional uh, Windows file server that way. <coughs> so the actual implementation is, it's less than 700 lines of Perl. Actually, I counted 600 lines of real Perl and 77 lines of comments. So it, it's a pretty, pretty uh, small implementation for what it does. Um, it, it relies heavily on DebConf to do a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, I would have loved to have implemented this in Python, to be honest, but um, I figured a few people might frown at me if Python became transitively essential on Debian. Um, so so I, I gave that a pass, and instead I, I went ahead and implemented in Perl, Perl. I did think in Python while I was writing it, but it, it so <laughs> if you find the Perl strange, that's probably why. Um, and about a third of that code is actually, it's code that's just there to cope with all the things that users might do to edit their files by hand. Um, the idea is that, you know, policy does say if the user changes the file, you're supposed to respect those local changes. This actually does that. So, you know, about 200 lines of code dedicated just to that within this, this config parser. But if a user goes in and just edits the config and adds extra module options at the end, we'll keep track of those. We'll make sure they get carried over when, when an upgrade happens or anything. Um, so it's, it's fairly robust, and I, I'm very proud that we, we complied with policy on that, because <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are many examples of scripts out there that don't completely in, uh, implement that requirement of policy, and I, I encourage everyone to do that whenever they're editing configuration files, because it's, it's a very useful feature of Debian. Um, here's a peek at some of the code. You see we're just including debconf here. Um, these are a couple of, of DebConf operations. I don't know if you've never written um, DebConf code in Perl. Um, the, there's, it's basically you get flat namespace um, for your various functions. So it can be a little bit opaque if you don't know, if, if you're not familiar with the API and you're trying to look at it. So the things that you see here on the function names that you're like, well, what is that? That's not a Perl function. It's because it's a DebConf function. Um, but yeah, we, we just, uh, we're reading in these, these configs we have a fun function here to parse them out and throw the profiles into a, a nice little hash for us. Then we use the xload template file extension of debconf, which is a beautiful little thing that uh, debconf and cdebconf both now support, uh, which allows uh, uh, scripts that are not maintainer scripts to force the debconf database to um, load in this template file. Because debconf being a cache, it's not required to be there if you don't do this. <laughs> so to ensure we always have the current version of those templates, uh, we, we call this function here. Um, and then we do a, a whole bunch of, you know, sorting and mapping and grepping and, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to go line by line. If anybody has questions about the code later, I'm happy to talk, but I'm not going to go through that in any detail right now. So why did it take us so long to get here? I mentioned this is an idea that we had six years ago about what we wanted to do with it. Um, now, part of it was I spent three years as a release manager, which means I didn't have any time to write any code. Um, but you know, the, the inspiration for this really came from Red Hat having a tool similar to this uh, a full decade ago, where you, when you set up a Red Hat system, you had auth config, which would prompt you, do you want LDAP, or do you want Kerberos, or do you want Unix authentication, or NIS, or those kinds of things. Um, but mm, I wasn't particularly impressed with the implementation of it, and uh, I, I felt that Debian needed something better. Um, perfect being the enemy of the good, or what have you, that meant we had nothing for six years, uh, until we could do it right. Um, so yeah, it, it was six months of thinking about it, followed by about two months of actual development once the opportunity arose to actually do it. Um, so 
my question to the audience is, you know, can we, can we narrow that, that six-year thinking about it? What, what can we do to, to be more, more active in Debian about making these things happen that we all know there, there's something that needs to get done, but it just doesn't happen? Um, and, and a lot of that, I think, comes down to mailing lists. And you know, we have a broad consensus about the idea that something needs to happen and that something's a good idea, but then we get bogged down in the details, you know. These are some examples I came up with in a little bit of a brainstorming in the hack lab this morning about things that you know, people think are a good idea, but we just don't actually make it to the implementation very quickly because we get bogged down in the details. Now, now in the case of, of uh, PAMOF update, I had the advantage of being, it was my idea and it was my package. So I wasn't actually dependent on uh, external consensus to implement that. So I, it was mostly a question of having the time to work on it. And uh, I'm very grateful to um, Canonical, my employer, for letting me work on that. And, and we were able to contribute that back to Debian. Um, uh, it, it didn't, uh, yeah, like I said, it, Ubuntu got it first simply because of the timing of the, the Lenny freeze. But um, a, as soon as it was feasible, we got that right into Debian. And uh, uh, I'm pleased with the results in spite of you know, a release critical bug here and there. Uh, nothing major, just, yeah, nothing major. Um, but, you know, I want to open the, the, the question up to you guys and hear your, your feedback about how we can, how we can do better about, about getting things to the implementation. Is there a microphone for Colin here? One, two, one, two. Um, first an observation, uh, committees suck at deciding on details and uh, the, the only way you're going to deal with uh, the problem you mentioned of, uh, of implementations lagging way behind the design is uh, let somebody just get on with it mm -hmm. and uh, stop. I, th I think we, have, we do have a big second guessing problem as a community as a whole. Um, the second is uh, second thing I wanted to ask was a query about uh, what PAM users are sorry not users uh, packages that are PAM consumers. Uh, I'm wearing my OpenSSH maintainer hat. Uh, is there anything that they should be doing better to uh, to make use of PAMOTH updates? Uh, a lot of those modules uh, ship configuration files that are full of comments about here are all the things that you might enable if you feel like doing so, that sort of thing. Is there anything that they could do better? So if you have lots of comments in your service config file that you think are options that people generally want to enable, maybe those should be config files that plug into this. Maybe it shouldn't be OpenSSH that provides it. Maybe it's a module that needs to be adapted to, to hook into PAMAuth update. Um, in the general case, you know, this is available to all services on Debian by default because the, they use the et cetera PAMD common dash foo includes, so they're already hooked in. Um, one of the things that's a, that's, that's a, a known blemish in, in, this, in the, the common foo is that we really need to have a separation between interactive and non-interactive session handling. And so I'd, I don't know in, if in the OpenSSH case if that's a cause for some of those additional commented out fields. But there's stuff that we cannot enable in the common session uh, file because it's specific to interactive sessions and it breaks stuff in non-interactive. And OpenSSH has supports both. So mm -hmm. right. that doesn't help either. <laughs> right. Uh, another question from Sam. Um, so, S Steve, I guess what I would say to the whole building consensus and, and, you know, not getting bogged down in the details is that one of the things we should work on doing is um, teaching people how to facilitate consensus decision making. Um, there are two aspects of it that I think are really important um, that we're kind of bad at. The first is making sure people actually believe their comment is um, 
something that needs to be decided in, in the form where they're deciding it. I mean, sometimes it's, it's reasonable to ask people, you know, if they bring up some nitpicky detail on Debian Devel. So, I mean, are you just giving the person who's actually doing this input, or do you believe that this issue is important enough that we actually need to reach agreement here? Because sometimes when you point that out to people, they'll say, oh, no, I was just, I was just thinking you might find my advice useful. Um, if you don't, that's fine too. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is that it's really important to actually leave the time at the appropriate stages in the process um, to get people on board. Um, you know, at the, in the early idea stage and then in the final proposal review stage, um, basically people in a community can, if they're sufficiently motivated, bog down any process. It's just, you know, you're not a community if that's not true. Um, and it's important to actually understand that there's going to be a, a part, that the part of being in a community with people is giving them the time to actually learn and come on board and give them the time to digest your design. And hopefully, you know, if it took you a year to come up with a design, hopefully it'll only take them a week or two to digest it. But when you don't give that time and work through the process, you encourage people to bog it down. And I actually think it's reasonable for the people to bog it down then. And I think we could be much better about both of those things. Hello? Okay, thank you. Um, so I first have a really quick technical question, which is are you looking at using triggers for your maintainer scripts? Um, it looked like they were very simple and might be triggerable, but I wasn't really sure. I hadn't thought of it. Okay. Um, I don't really have my brain completely wrapped around triggers yet. Yeah, um, <laughs> join the club. Perhaps it's... Yeah. Um, as far as the, the question at the end, I... Um, I, I think you, you said the perfect is the enemy of the good, and that's true, and I think it's important to sometimes go with the imperfect at the beginning. Yeah. Um, if, you had, if you had put in the Red Hat system six years ago, would that have been a bad thing necessarily? There might have been some kind of a nasty transition that you had to deal with or something, but it might have actually been worth it in the final analysis to do that. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not sure if it would have been worth it or not. Um, mm -hmm. The transition concerns were why I never did that. Right. It was, it, yeah. it, well, not, not only transition concerns, but policy compliance. Because mm -hmm. auth config, I couldn't see a way to do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, and sure. Be policy compliance. Yeah, so yeah, right. Waited until we but, had the full design. Um, uh, some, some other examples. You have dpackage source 2 up there. If you look at dpackage source v3, I think it can be useful to design in a way to you know, implement one and throw it away. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at what I did in V3, it has multiple possible formats. I didn't really intend to have the one that I wrote be thrown away, but apparently Debian wants to do that. <laughs> but that's okay if it ends up that we end up with a, with a version three that people like. Right. So it, it can be good to just, um, another example is you were using Deb Helper throughout, de throughout, design, throughout um, you know, the implementation of this. Um, Deb Helper was basically implemented to be thrown away, and we're in the process of doing that. Of course, we've been in the process of doing that for going on, you know, six or eight years now, but we'll probably get there eventually. Mm -hmm. And some of, a few of the warts that you encountered will go away, although not all of them. <laughs> sure. um, so I, I think that both of those are important. I also think that delegating things to people just saying we trust you to go off and do something we're not going to micromanage and look at all the details and if it comes back and it's completely wrong we might end up tossing it out but not sitting there over someone's shoulder as a list and looking at every decision they make I think it'd be a really good thing because people do come up with good designs on their own yeah, and, and if you run the design by a group of people that's good but you should be able to say well I know that these people have this set of concerns, but I just can't handle that. Mm -hmm. And I'm still going to come up with something as useful as I can for the first iteration. Sure. And that's that's one point that uh, I certainly agree with about, uh, I'm not sure what we can do better to empower developers to go out and do that. Because I think, I think a lot of the things that should happen end up getting bogged down in the mailing list discussions. Um, and I'm not sure how to overcome that. And I, maybe it comes down to the guiding consensus I don't know if the debt process is, is going to help with this. Um, uh, Buxy, you, you're 
involved in the DEP3, right? Yeah. Are you finding the process helps that? Well, I guess Petra has the microphone, so let's listen to him first, and then we can talk maybe about that a little bit later. Yeah, a few comments about uh, how to get things done. I believe we shouldn't be that afraid of taking criticism on the mailing list. Uh, I think that's the main problem. People are uh, afraid of doing something because they will get criticized on the mailing list or on the IRC or whatever. Uh, personally, I believe rough consensus, getting feedback, and then going ahead and do what you want anyway, even if uh, uh, some people believe it's a bad idea. Because if you believe it's a good idea, at least someone believes it's a good idea, and you should go ahead with it. <laughs> uh, <coughs> and of course, sometimes it takes a long time because you have to take over the System 5 in its subsystem first before you can continue with your plans. But <laughs> 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 it's going to happen anyway. Uh, and sometimes people come up with uh, arguments or comments and suggest that actually change your mind because people are, there are a lot of smart people in Debian. You should listen to people when they are giving uh, suggestions or arguments, but you shouldn't let them do the decision. If you believe it's a good idea still after people complaining or explaining use cases that you never heard about, you really should do something different. But if you're still not convinced after some arguments on the mailing list, you should go ahead. I really believe that's the important thing to make things happen. And as you always say, if it's a really bad idea, someone will rip it out again. And uh, for the PAM thing, I have a one question, uh, one uh, feature in, uh, in Debian EDU which is uh, really wanted and we are working on to, to get working is uh, laptops, uh, disconnected laptops. We want to have LDAP authentication when you're on the network and cached passwords with the same login when you're off the network. Is that easy to enable with the new uh, PAM auth update thing? Um. Yes. So, are you using the PAM C creds module currently, or what are you using for the caching, or is this something that you haven't implemented I yet? I think it's the cache credentials packet we are yeah. looking at. libpam C creds, I think, is yeah. probably the one. Um, there's a bug in the PAM LDAP profile in that it doesn't do the right thing with PAM C creds, and it, it needs to be ironed out. But in terms of the architecture, s certainly, I mean, both modules can provide profiles and it, they can work together. Um, module a couple of bugs that still need to be sorted. Good. So, uh, I mean, th I think Triggers was an interesting example of how this design process works. If we if we leave aside the totally hideous row over the the, the merging of the implementation, the actual design I found um, the design process worked really well. It did take quite a while, but I got a really good lot of feedback and I think pretty much everybody was happy with what we came up with um, and you just need to uh, you know as the person being in charge almost of the of the design you need to understand what people want and then give it to them and I didn't find that really very difficult and also I was very pleased at the time I was wearing an Ubuntu hat and I didn't get any aggro about that <laughs> at all um, which I thought was uh, you know, maybe gives a lie to some of that stuff. Uh, and while I'm talking about triggers, if anybody wants like consultancy on uh, <laughs> on how it should work, you know, come and find me. I'm hanging around in Hack Lab One. Hack Lab One. <laughs> One thing that occurred to me is that uh, <clears throat> if you are doing major changes to the system, it's uh, important to have a way back. Uh, that's been one of the things I've been focusing on with dependency-based boot sequencing. There is like, you can try it out, and if you don't like it, you can return to where you used to be. And f for triggers, of course, you can use it if you want to. You can ignore it if you don't. If you don't force people to use it, the dash as sh uh, alternative is like an alternative. You can disable it if you, if you don't like it. If you make sure that good ideas are always optional, at least initially, Eventually, everyone will be using it, and then we can take away the option. Mm -hmm. But if we make sure that there is always a way back for unsure people that are not convinced that it's a good idea yet, then it's a lot easier to introduce it into Debian. Yeah, that's actually a point that I don't entirely agree with you on. I mean, we've had this conversation before about giving people a way back. It, it is useful in many cases to make it optional. There are some cases where the extra effort involved in making it optional 
uh, it's better to force everybody to deal with it and help you implement it than to <laughs> spend more time up front making people happy about it. Well, so, one, so it can go either way. One word about triggers. Uh, there is a fact that it was a really co complex specification, and very few people were able to comment uh, usefully. So the kind of people that have an opinion on everything didn't participate in this discussion, and it <laughs> went forward. So we should have everything, all our proposals should be complex enough <laughs> to, to withstand... Not sure, but uh, <laughs> well, it, it's a reason why it helped. Now, coming back to the debt process, uh, uh, I'm driving the debt tree currently, and. Uh, I try to do it in a different way because, well, usually I have strong opinions on stuff that I want to do and uh, I defend my opinions. And here I try really to step back and uh, just say the long-term goal and not to go straight into details. I let people discuss. I see if there is some consensus. I choose uh, uh, when I have, well, well, I choose something when I have to because uh, people have d different opinions. And then I come back to a new uh, round and say, okay, people have said that and that. I think this one is uh, the best consensus, the best choice currently. Do you agree or do you have something else? It takes more time, but uh, I think the discussion goes forward and without uh, too much conflicts. Mm -hmm. do, do you also feel like it helps you recognize when the discussion is at its logical end? Because that's one of the, my hopes for the debt process is, is if we're seeking consensus explicitly, that we have a way of curtailing the mailing list discussions, which otherwise tend to be somewhat open-ended and trail off and end up down rat holes and everything else. I think that's been a problem in the past with our mailing list discussion. And I, in your experience, you find that the debt process is helping with that? Uh, somewhat, yes. Uh, the number of comments are clearly going down uh, after a few rounds. So, uh, well. There's a point where you can say, uh, if nobody else has anything else to say, I'm going to move it from draft to accepted or something like that. And uh, well, well, we'll see how, how it goes further. But I think it's worth trying, at least. And before I give back the mic to other people <laughs> to continue the discussion, uh, there's also projects, of course, where you where you don't need to have so so broad approval, but. Uh, in my case, it's a new source format. Uh, I, as a DPKG maintainer, I can make choice and go forward. Exactly, exactly. Uh, that's my question and uh, my discussion, the problems that we have, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can make choice on this DPKG side, but of course, I cannot decide or force the project to uh, uh, use it. I know lots of people who are eager to use it, uh, but I also know that Ganef really doesn't care about the new format. It's not a package at all, and it doesn't bring in much uh, uh, advantages as a FTP master. So, well, it's just sitting on my patch. Not, it's not a, it's not doing against me, but just so it doesn't care enough to take the time right now. So, I don't know if you have ideas how we can solve this kind of problem. Uh, would the debt process help because we? Ganef would see that many people are interested in it, or I don't know. If I don't see Ganef in the room. I think <laughs> corner him at DebCon face to face oh, and ask him. It's it's bland. <laughs> I'm going to attend the FTP Master Broth and <laughs> ask the questions there. But well, it's just a question. If you can comment on this question afterwards, I'd be glad to hear your opinion. Just going back to uh, Petter's comment about uh, it making it easy to go back, uh, the other reason to make it easy to go back is that when you design to make it easy to revert changes, you also tend, as a side effect of that, to make it easier for people to go forward to implement uh, new or better alternatives and drop them in. Uh, we, I mean, we find with, uh, with DebConf that uh, replacing it with CDebConf was really, really painful because we had to go around everybody who'd, uh, who'd sat writing uh, depends DebConf brackets thing in their control files for years. And uh, when, you, when you design up front for uh, your uh, module to be optional, then you also tend to make it easier to do something better in the future. Um, I just wanted to draw out a point that I think has been sort of implicit in this. Um, Ian had mentioned how he worked on triggers at Ubuntu, 
and that did work out pretty well on the list. There weren't any flames or anything. Um, Steve had mentioned how the PAMAUTH update stuff was implemented. Uh, first, it went into Ubuntu because it wasn't, you know, we couldn't get into Debian because of scheduling issues. Um, I, I think there's a bit of a trend here. I think you also had a slide up there about um, BinSH being the default shell, which I believe was implemented first in Ubuntu, and we're now looking at implementing. So it almost seems to me at this point that if one wanted to make a large change to how Debian made things, <laughs> it might be ad advantageous to Im implement it first in Ubuntu. <laughs> I'm not saying that this is a good idea for Debian as a project, but I am saying that there seems to be a trend here, and that's something we might want to think about. And in the case of triggers, if Ubuntu had implemented triggers and Debian had not taken that implementation and used it, Debian would have basically been screwed. We would have diverged from Ubuntu to the point that we couldn't use any of their packages anymore or any of their packaging. And so while we did review Ian's proposal and we liked it a lot, even if we had hated it, <laughs> we would have still had to do something about that. So, yeah. So, on the other hand, just from just from the other side of the fence, uh, it would not have been in Ubuntu's interest to end up in a position where we had to maintain this enormous delta of death. So, but on the other hand, I think that it actually got into Ubuntu before Debian had even gotten around to saying that we were going to accept it. So, uh, I don't know. This is a yeah. I'm not saying that Ubuntu is trying to you know, trying to sabotage us or anything like that. I'm just saying that this is something that I think is developing in the project, and we should really be aware of. The, this issue that Steve has brought up is a big problem and you know, has some interesting consequences. So th that's a, an interesting point. Um, one reason that triggers went into Ubuntu first is obviously because at the time I was being paid for, you know, paid by Canonical to do it. But I did the design. The design was done in Debian. It didn't really use the Ubuntu design processes. And because Debian doesn't have a formal way of signing off on a design, you know, eventually got to the point where people weren't making new comments on the spec and I decided it was finished in the same way as I had previously done about anything else that I'd done in Debian. Um, you know, you decide that people seem to like it and so you implement it. And indeed, if Debian hadn't adopted it, it would have been completely pointless for Ubuntu. Um, and I very much, you know, the whole plan involved it being adopted in Debian. There was no possibility of it being any point otherwise, really. Yeah, in the case of the PAM uh, implementation, uh, I did use the. Sorry. Oh yes, it was always the plan. It was always the plan to put it in both Debian and Ubuntu. Um, I did use the Ubuntu design process because I found that framework very helpful to me, and I didn't feel like I had a, a structure um, that that facilitated that in in the Debian side of things. And so I, I did use the the UDS uh, environment and the, and the spec process for developing that and and bringing the design together. Um, so maybe there's something we can do better in Debian to have a formalized spec process. I, I don't know if the DEP process is it or not, but um, um, well, simply the, the wiki framework for developing a spec and all the issues you need to think about when doing a spec was something that was helpful to me. I suppose uh, in the in the last week there was this issue that came up on the on the IRC channels uh, with Dash and Bash and the dependency and. Uh, one of the things, I mean, I've, I've been a driver in also in this discussion, one of the pr um, people criticizing the current approach. So uh, take that with a bit of grain of salt, uh, grain of salt, what I have to say. But I think one of the problems is that on the one hand, um, we certainly need people to make decisions. And like you went ahead and implemented PAM auth update without great talking about it beforehand. You just did it. And and then it was a convincing proposal. That's necessary. But when it's something that actually touches the entire um, um, distro, or something that is very, uh, very much of a, um, a religious thing, as well. can you still hear me? I can still hear you, but okay. the mic can't. Um, <laughs> somewhat of a religious change as well. Then um, I think one of the important things. So these executive decisions, that's better. These executive decisions, um, they are important to be made, but if, if it's an issue that sort of touches everyone, then you need to give everyone a chance to get at the information and to be able to have a word in this. And then after you get to the point where everybody had a bit of a, of a say, two weeks, four months, six years, whatever it is, um, then make that executive decision. I think the debt process is a, is a step in the right direction. 
Um, I think it is pretty much like the blueprints or like a wiki-based um, approach. There's probably still rough edges to it, but I think it's important that if you want to drive change in the distribution, then you should uh, make sure that you make it easy for everyone out there to see the pros and the cons at all points in time and not say, look at this thread on the mailing list which has been going on for six and a half months <laughs> because it's just a pain to do it and you can't find the information. But if you, as the driver for a change, maintain a central resource with all the pros and cons, that's a good basis for discussion and that's also a good basis to make executive decisions. Now I also have a second small point um, because you were um, on your slide earlier, you were asking how can we actually make sure that we don't take six years to implement these changes. I've been um, doing some research over the last couple of years and uh, I've been using a method that I would like to talk about during my talk tomorrow, I think, on Sunday. No, wait, next Thursday it is at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Whew! <laughs> Yeah, um, I know it's Thursday. Um, it's my research results presented, but I'm also going to be talking about this Delphi approach. Um, I think that it is something that we could learn from and possibly even institutionalize it within an open source project. Um, and basically, what um, I think, Raphael, earlier you hinted at this, uh, your DEP3 process right now, where you are actually interested in it, but you're trying to stay away and keep your interest in the background so that other people have something to say. Um, the Delphi process could have someone that is actually not really, ha does not have an invested interest in, a, in an issue, just collect information and, and uh, moderate a discussion. And that way, ho hopefully, find consensus a little faster. So that's sorry, I've been talking way too long. <laughs> to respond to your first point, I think it's interesting that you draw a distinction between switching bin sh default or, or how we handle bin sh versus PAM, and you say, one of these affects everybody, and so PAM is what? I mean, it's transitively essential. You can't get rid of it on the system. It affects everybody's system. Um, bin SH, everybody seems to have an opinion about it, but in point of actual fact, the implementation, I, yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm in that d discussion, and maybe we should have that out of band, because I... Uh, 